As a visual effects artist, when I'm watching movies, I can't help but get distracted analyzing all the awesome and sometimes not so awesome visual effects on screen. When I'm watching sports, however, that part of my brain is turned off. Until recently, when I was watching a basketball game minding my own business and saw this. A percentage tracker that tells you a player's probability to make a shot from that specific spot on the floor in real time. Which, don't get me wrong, is super cool, but I missed the whole first half just staring at it. But after that game, I started noticing just how many effects are actually happening during a sports broadcast, and there's a lot. And whereas Hollywood films have months, if not years, to execute effects, these visualizations are being generated largely in real time. This sent me down a big old rabbit hole, and I was shocked to find that the tech behind visual effects in live sports is just as fascinating and intricate as the stuff that we see coming out of Hollywood. But while visual effects in film have been around since, well, nearly the advent of the camera itself, visual effects in sports emerged not that long ago. Imagine, it's the year 1993. I will faithfully execute the office of president. You're surfing channels looking for a game to watch, and you land on a shot of a green field with some white lines on it. There's guys in different colored uniforms, and you hear two old men just rambling. Didn't you coach Burt Reynolds? Yes, I did. Was he any good? But other than that, you have no information. It's difficult to keep up with the flow of the game when vital information like what's the score and how much time is left is not on the screen. So it's easy to see how groundbreaking the introduction of the score bug was in 1994. You can look up there, you always know what the score is. While a digital scoreboard may seem somewhat trivial, it was actually a giant hurdle at the time to get the graphic on the screen. The first problem was that each stadium had its own archaic scoreboard with different ports, cables, and electronics. And for a while, broadcast teams had to manually solder and rewire parts in order to get the score interfaces working with their graphics interface. That's getting the data. But processing that data in the mid 90s was a whole other adventure. The live feed of the scoreboard had to run to a group of broadcast trucks. The graphic overlay system, which at the time cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, would take the scoreboard data and render a rudimentary graphic. That graphic consists of two video streams, the fill, which contains the actual graphic, and the all-important key, which contains the transparency map that indicates which pixels the graphic should affect. These two streams are then input into the linear key, or another piece of video equipment that actually overlays the graphic on the broadcast video. All that work for this. Now, funnily enough, after first seeing it, many network executives actually feared the score bug would discourage viewers from watching. The idea being, you tune in, you find out the Steelers are losing by 51, and decide, I'm not watching this, so you turn it off before you get invested. But viewers love the score bug, and so networks eventually adopted it universally. Other sports quickly adopted their own version of the score bug, and so began a whole new level of engagement with broadcast sports, as well as an arms race over who could deliver the most compelling and immediate visual context to fans. With football being the biggest sport in the US, the NFL continued to innovate. 1998 saw the introduction of perhaps the most beloved on-screen graphic, the digital first down line, also known as the yellow line. You see, rather than a simple 2D graphic with some numbers, that beautiful yellow line is much more elegant in how it conveys to the viewer what the goal of the offense is. It is a literal storytelling device. This team has to reach this far in this much time or else they lose possession. It made football immediately more accessible to non-football fans. And the way it works is genius. Stadiums are equipped with three high game cameras. These produce the camera angle we're most used to seeing in a football game. These cameras are connected to computers that contain a 3D representation of the field that was captured earlier through laser scanning. Now, because these broadcast cameras pan, tilt, and zoom to follow the action, this transformation data has to be captured for every frame as well. By updating every frame, the camera's view in relation to the field matches between the real world and the 3D representation perfectly. With all of this math in order, a yellow line can finally be drawn in 3D perspective. You think that's it? No, we're only halfway there because the last thing the viewer wants is a giant yellow line drawn all over the players like a baby John Madden scribbled on the TV. Get out of here, baby John. The system was designed to tuck the line under the players while still keeping it on top of the grass. This is called color filtering. 
and it's done by a very specific software that takes an average of all the hues of the green you want the line to be able to show up on. It's kind of like green screen, only unlike a green screen, these hue values have to be monitored by a technician throughout the entire game, as weather and lighting conditions invariably change. This combination of technologies created a final result that was so seamless to new audiences that many people thought that it was actually chalk that the stadium workers would clean up and reset off camera. It was simultaneously invisible and essential. A few years later, ESPN built on these visual effects and introduced the K-Zone to the MLB. What a cool name, the K-Zone. The K-Zone presents a simple box to represent the batter's strike zone and shows whether the pitch is a strike or a ball. Simple, right? Well, it's never that simple. Two cameras, one above home plate and one above first base, are set up to capture the path of the ball once it leaves the pitcher's hand. As the pitch is thrown, each camera captures over 60 ball positions per second, which is fed to a computer that basically calculates the trajectory and the speed. Now, we aren't quite done. From a third camera perspective, they specify the strike zone, the box. The height is measured from the bottom of the batter's knees to their mid shoulder. It's controlled by a dude on a joystick who draws it for every batter that comes up. And this camera looks for any intersection between the translated position of the ball and the boundaries of the strike zone. An intersection indicates a strike. Now, while the K zone is somewhat controversial to fans, like the first downline, it's still providing a simple visual representation of a critical part of the game. These advancements were taking flat graphics and bringing them into the game. This completely changed the viewing experience of some sports. I mean, think about NASCAR. What was once blurry video of a bunch of cars driving in a circle began to look like a fast paced car chase with all the information you might need to make sense of it right there on the screen. Through the use of satellites, in-car sensors, and 3D reconstructions of the raceway, broadcasters were able to track graphics to moving cars, as well as provide crazy in-depth information like gear position, rotations per minute speed, fuel consumption, all the stuff you wanna know, and plenty that you probably don't. And while these sensors have been hard mounted in cars for a while now, more recently this kind of real-time tracking has been brought to players. In 2014, the NFL introduced RFID, or Radio Frequency Identification Tracking, for those of you who like more words. The way it works is each player has two RFID tags, one under each shoulder pad. That sends out positional data to the 24 ultra-wide band antennas placed throughout the middle level of the stadium. Linemen actually need an extra tag on their back due to the fact that they start the play so low to the ground and not because they're so big. They're massive. Don't body shame. The ball, the pylons, and even the officials get RFID tags too. With 53 players on each team and all the extra devices being tracked, that's over 300 devices working in tandem to provide data such as location, speed, distance traveled, and acceleration. And that's being updated 10 times per second. So imagine what is being created in a modern NFL broadcast. You have all the players tracked in 3D space, which we can lay out on our 3D representation of the field. And now even moving cameras like the Skycam use real-time 3D tracking to keep the virtual field in line with the real field at all times. This means more complex graphics can be placed on a moving image like the blue line of scrimmage, timers, and countdowns, and this insanity. Look at the slime monster! Oh, it's the abominable slime man! But these graphics can also make use of those RFID trackers to create overlays of live statistics that are tagged to players, and 3D lines tracing routes of a receiver, and even the path of the football. And so at this point in sports, the cameras, the field, the balls, and the players are all almost perfectly replicated in 3D in real time. What could possibly be crazier? Well, volumetric capture. Volumetric capture is a technique where a subject is filmed by an array of cameras from all angles to generate realistic and interactive 3D renderings. It was first introduced in golf, where players were brought into a studio to capture their swing in 3D, which was later used during broadcast for an in-depth three-dimensional breakdown. Now this application is cool, but took days to process. And the Brooklyn Nets ain't got time for that. So last year they introduced the Netiverse. 110 high-resolution Canon cameras were placed around Barclays Center to capture the game. That data was used to generate realistic renderings of the players and environments in a matter of seconds allowing the viewer to direct a virtual camera wherever they want on a CG court, seeing angles that were never before possible.
But why stop at just capturing a real game? Why not add your own skins, your own environment, and fully customize an entire game and broadcast? Well, that's exactly what Disney did just this past year during an NFL game between the Falcons and the Jaguars. The entire football field and all the players in this game were brought into the virtual world in a Toy Story themed environment. You had colorful trails behind the ball and the players, Slinky as a first down line, and even the commentators as toys. Look at them, sitting there in their little motion capture suits. It's adorable. It was a culmination of all the technology we've been discussing, like a proportionally accurate CG field, RFID tracking of the players, and the icing on this cake? A machine learning algorithm trained on human motion that faithfully applied animation to all the toy players. All of this was being piped into the Unity game engine in order to be rendered and played back at only a 20 second delay from the live game broadcast. That's pretty good considering they're converting a real game into a literal video game. Now, growing up, I always believed that as graphical capabilities grew, sports video games like NBA 2K, FIFA, and Madden would look more and more like real life. But the inverse is proving to be true. We now have the capability to take a real sports event and replicate it almost perfectly in the computer, giving us the ability to visualize any piece of information, view the game from any perspective, or just make the whole thing look like whatever we want. Anything is possible. But if anything is possible, that begs the question, when do you stop adding more? You see, sports broadcasting is currently in the same boat as Hollywood. And as we've learned this last year with some massive box office bombs, just because you can do anything with visual effects doesn't mean you should. Looking at you, Flash. What's he talking about? In both athletics and film, gimmicks and spectacle only get you so far. What viewers really care about is the story, an athlete's journey, their rivalries, their struggles, and their triumphs. It's about the unspoken narratives etched into each play. The stories in sport are what pull us in and keep us watching. It's what makes sports universal. And visual effects should serve above all else as a tool to connect us deeper to the heart of that story. And as we've seen, the technological innovations that have stood the test of time have done just that. Ah. So the next time you turn on a game or throw on a match, take a moment to appreciate all the visual storytelling that is hiding in plain sight. And heck, maybe even tip your cap to the unsung artists and technical wizards behind the scenes who are pushing us forward and making all of this possible. Researching this topic was such a good time. If you guys have any other topics you'd like us to take a technical deep dive on, let us know in the comments down below. But in the meantime, I got a fake game to pretend to watch. So get out of here. <laughs> Oh, oh, we should have scored that goal. Oh, I'm gonna, this is, I'm gonna bring this into my home life. I'm gonna take this out on my, the people closest to me. Sports make me feel.